In this section, we'll be taking a look at the concepts of addiction and violence. These are the objectives. We will be looking at the relationship between addiction and violence with other concepts, the risk factors, prevention strategies, and then demonstrating nursing process and evidence-based care. We're going to take a look at the student learning outcomes of providing safe, patient-centered, evidence-based nursing care for chronic and vulnerable populations guided by the care test philosophy, demonstrating critical thinking and clinical reasoning when providing quality care in community-based settings, communicating effectively with patients, families, and members of the interprofessional team, managing care for clients and groups in diverse settings, and practicing as a competent nurse assimilating professional, ethical, and legal guidelines. Addiction is defined as being dependent, which is a physiological need for a substance that a client cannot control and results in withdrawal symptoms if withheld. There are multiple different factors that are involved with addiction from um, pretty much a holistic point of view. And addiction can occur with a variety of different substances, including alcohol, uh, drug abuse, nicotine. Um, caffeine is considered an addictive substance as well. Addiction does overlap with a variety of other concepts. If you take a look in your textbook on page 1523, the chart that is in there, it kind of summarizes them all very nicely. But family dynamics are going to be affected. Nutrition um, is affected as well. Cognition, mainly due to the thiamine levels in the system that are altered with um, particularly alcohol abuse. Stress and coping is going to be influenced, and this actually could potentially lead to um, violence as well if they have ineffective uh, coping strategies. And then safety we'll be taking a look at as well. And this is safety related to um, high-risk behaviors um, and also violence tendencies as well. The CAGE assessment is a tool that can be used for anybody that you could that you're suspecting is drinking too much alcohol. And this is an assessment you would ask them these questions. If they answer one in uh, a yes, then you want to further question and kind of narrow down because you would be starting to suspect that there might be an issue with alcohol. If they answer two yeses, you definitely want to pursue uh, a treatment option for them to make sure that um, they are managed effectively. With alcohol withdrawal, it usually starts to uh, symptoms appear within 4 to 12 hours after um, their last drink. So you really want to determine when was the last time they had um, their last drink so then you can act uh, accurately assess and manage based on that uh, time frame. Manifestations, you take a look at um, irritability, tremors, nausea, vomiting, headaches, um, diaphoresis, anxiety, sleep disturbances, tachycardia, and elevated uh, blood pressures. For delirium tremens, um, these are when alcohol is like um, like immediately withdrawn from an individual, and then they will develop signs of increased blood pressure, tachycardia, and diaphoresis, and those are all indications of alcohol withdrawal delirium. Within the hospital setting, uh, most facilities will have a CEWA score that they follow, and this is really taking a look at uh, a couple different areas to determine what the severity of alcohol withdrawal symptoms are, and it's a tool that measures for high blood pressure, rapid pulse and respirations, tremors, insomnia, irritability, sweating, and convulsions. And these are all symptoms that um, 
they are going through alcohol withdrawal, and depending on their score is what protocol you follow for medications, which we're not going to really go into detail with that. You'll revisit that when you get into the mental health rotation. For management of addiction, you want to pay attention to a couple different aspects, no matter which type of care environment you're in, whether it's a community-based setting or an inpatient setting. Um, the priorities are going to be the same irregardless of setting. And really, you want to have the client be able to admit that the substance is controlling their life, um, see if they're willing to enter a treatment facility. You want them to experience no complications to obtain um, optimal nutritional status and to participate in support groups. So you want to promote safety, safety for the patient and safety for th yourself. You want to determine whether what their level of disorientation and confusion is. Um, are they knowledgeable that they are confused and their mental status is altered? Um, put them in a quiet environment. So if you are in the community setting, to take this individual aside from a group, um, maybe take somebody else with you to maintain your own safety, but you really want to decrease any kind of external stimulus. Um, you want to orient the patient if they are disoriented. You want to try to encourage their own participation in treatment and healthy coping skills. You need to establish a trusting relationship and to have effective communication strategies that we talked about in the first class. Um, that's going to be very important when communicating with a patient that is experiencing an addiction providing adequate nutrition and nutrition education because depending on their addiction, they're going to be lacking in certain nutritional supplements. Um, so encouraging proper diet and healthy choices if possible. Um, providing client education as far as what their own knowledge level is and their readiness to learn. You need to develop a teaching plan that's going to be realistic and measurable objectives, something that's going to be um, very meaningful for that individual. And then you want to start simple and then build more complex. If the patient is experiencing a withdrawal, you need to, again, promote their safety and your safety. You want to assess orientation frequently, explain everything to the the patient or the client so they understand what is going on and what you are doing, um, providing simple step-by-step -step instructions when you're communicating. Do not argue with the client if they're experiencing delusions or hallucinations. You can just simply state that you do not see that. It is not part of reality, um, but except that they are perceiving whatever it is that they are perceiving. So you do not want to um, agree with them, but you can gently just say that it is not reality of what they're experiencing. So then it actually um, promotes a feeling of safety for them, too, to know that what they're seeing is not actually there or what they're hearing. Um, and then just bring them back to the present, talk about real people and real events. In this section, I want to discuss trafficking. Human trafficking is a form of modern day slavery where people profit from the control and exploitation of others. It is through force and coercion. There are two different types. There is sex trafficking in which individuals are forced into sexual acts of service for other individuals and then there is also laboring labor trafficking in which people are forced to perform labor um, and are coerced into it there are laws under ohio law trafficking in persons is a first degree felony with a mandatory minimum of 10 years in prison it is estimated in Ohio that there are approximately a thousand individuals each year that are victims of human trafficking. 
and there are an additional 3,000 runaways who are at risk for falling into human trafficking. There is an Ohio Human Trafficking Task Force that has undertaken this issue and tried to assist. And since they have um, developed, they have been actually very effective in trying to help individuals see a different path um, in a different possibility with their life. So there are, I mean, we talked about Ohio, across the U.S., there is approximately 100,000 individuals in sex trafficking, and throughout the world on a global level, there's approximately 21 million. So in the U.S. and in Ohio, there, through this trafficking, um, the task force, they have developed a safe harbor law where victims of trafficking actually are able to obtain supportive services and are not charged. So the majority of prostitutes, there are 96% that are juvenile that actually are involved in prostitution, they are runaways. Um, an additional women that were charged with prostitution in the US what they did was a study and they actually developed an assessment tool to be able to identify victims. And through this assessment tool, they actually identified that 92% of women who were charged with prostitution fell within the definition of trafficking. So from all of this data that was collected, they were able to implement different interventions through the task force, specifically that safe harbor law and also increasing the penalty, um, in up upping it to a first degree felony with that minimum of 10 years in prison. So why we were talking about trafficking in this course is that at risk, vulnerable individuals are more likely to be involved in human trafficking. So there's this acronym Rescue Child. These are the individuals that are at risk. So runaways, which I just mentioned, um, those that have educational difficulties, history of sexual assault, court appearances, using drugs and alcohol, and emotional abuse. And then that child part is child abuse and neglect, homelessness, influential others involved in prostitution, loving someone much older, which is also a piece of the assessment that we will be talking about in a moment, and then difficulty making friends. So as you're looking at individuals and trying to identify their risk, if they fall into any of these categories, obviously the more categories they fall into, the higher their risk is going to be. The next three slides are going to look at some of the red flags of indicators of human trafficking. You can read all of them on your own. I just want to point out a few. The inability to attend school on a regular basis or unexplained absences, a change in school performance. So they're not able to focus, they're falling asleep all the time, and this is a change in their pattern of behavior. Also, the hunger, malnourishment, and inappropriate dress. So a lot of uh, people that are involved in human trafficking, they use deprivation in order to control their victims. So they will withhold food, water, safe environment, sleep, in order to control that individual and force them into this acts of service or of labor. So those are some red flags as well. Inappropriate dress. So they may, especially if they're in sex trafficking, they may be on call. So their clothing may reflect their prostitution lifestyle. So it might be a little bit more skimpier, short skirts, tighter clothing. Uh, and in the winter time, they may be dressing like this as well. So that's, again, another indication or a red flag. 
So again, this slide is going to continue those red flags. Again, uh, just a couple to point out that there's a sudden change in attire, behavior, material possessions, sudden change in attention to personal hygiene. So a lot of times, again, the people that are involved with trafficking, they will take a group of, of their victims into salons and have them with specific hairstyles get their nails done um, make them look visually appealing um, to increase their profits and they also use it as a reward system so if you do this then i will purchase that 200 hundred dollar purse that you really would like or you can have your hair and nails done and again, if you look at the people that are at risk, these are individuals that maybe have never had the resources to be able to have these types of experiences. So this is a reward for them, and they use this type of manipulation. Also on this slide is a boyfriend or girlfriend who is noticeably older. So this is your 12, 13, 14 year old that maybe has a 20 year old boyfriend or girlfriend. That is not your typical type of relationship and that is something that you really do need to question because that is a significant red flag. Some more red flags, again, some that I wanna point out. The tattoos, it is a form of branding. So the person in control has a specific brand that identifies that they are their property. So if they are not able to explain their tattoo in a way that you believe, again, that's another red flag. Um, symptoms of daydreaming, hyper arousal, um, changes of behavior, inability to bond, shyness, forgetfulness. Again, a lot of times victims learn not to make eye contact. They cannot trust anybody. They do not make eye contact with other people. If they make eye contact with another person in charge, they now become that person's property. Um, and in order for the original person to get them back, um, they have to pay a large fee. And then typically, that victim is punished so that they will never do that again. So they learn not to make eye contact with anybody. The effects of victims are going to be both physical and psychological. This is going to be something that is going to be long term. This is something that these individuals, they do not choose this lifestyle. They are forced, they co are coerced into it, and sometimes they don't even realize what is happening because they have either very low self-esteem, the environments that they grew up in are not supportive, they're not loving, they're not nurturing. So they may not realize any other lifestyle, they may not realize any other possibility. So typically once there is an intervention and they have the resources in place and those supportive services they begin to see that they were forced they were coerced this was not something that was their fault and a lot of victims will say that i thought it was my fault um, so again just take a look at the slides so you understand some of the long-term complications that victims can be experiencing so as a nurse, you need to be very vigilant of the individuals that you will be working with to look for those at risk, look for those red flag indicators that there might be an issue going on. And then if you are suspecting anything, if there's any kind of gut feeling, if even if it turns out that it is not what you were thinking, that's okay. It's better to be vigilant and assess and identify and it's not up to you to decide whether this is something a, a definite case of trafficking or this is maybe something that you are misinterpreting that's not your responsibility your responsibility is to assess it and to report it and let the experts figure out whether this is a true case or not so some of the assessment questions again you can look at these um 
because of the age difference between boyfriend and girlfriend is one of the red flags. So to be able to say, how did you meet with your boyfriend or girlfriend? Um, have you ever tried to break up with them or leave them? Is there anything preventing or threatening you? Do you want help leaving? So again, this may not be something that is answered positively, but the more people that help with that type of intervention and with that questioning, it helps them see a different lifestyle. Um, are your family members or friends in danger if you try to leave? So some of the people that had these types of organizations with trafficking, they will use coercion of threats against family members. So this is the older teenage girl that has a younger sister and they are threatened that the younger sister will be sold overseas, they will never see them again, um, and they will be the victim of human trafficking if the older sibling does not cooperate. So they are protecting their younger sibling from that lifestyle. Um, are you being forced to do work that you didn't want to do? Are, have you been lied to? Has anybody offered you money or um, in exchange for sex? Does anyone make you have sex? So those are all good assessment questions to determine whether your gut feelings of those red flags and at risk are more valid. So what do you do if you suspect that somebody is a victim of human trafficking, either sex trafficking or labor trafficking? There is a National Human Trafficking Resource Center a hotline, the number I have on here for you. I would kind of keep this someplace where you have it when you are working, just in case you need to make a phone call. They can help you with assessment questions, they can help you with referrals, resources, what are the next steps, what do you do with this particular person prior to discharging, or, discharging them or letting them leave the facility. So they're an excellent source of information. Also, be familiar with what your facility policies are. So there has been a great push within the last several years to educate healthcare professionals on human trafficking and how to recognize it. So facilities are going to have policies in place to help with identification and what to do. So the big thing is, if even, like I said, if it's a gut feeling, go with your gut and report it. So they will investigate, they will be able to help you with that assessment. So the main goal is to help victims and to rescue them from that environment. So we'll talk some more in class about some particular cases. Um, there is resources that I listed in your syllabus that I want you to take a look at as far as the human trafficking task force there is also it's just kind of for your information but it's a really good uh it's like an online um, education with a video you can actually get a ce for it i know you're not thinking of ces right now but it's good for a portfolio um, when you go to apply for your positions. It's a free um, in-service. There's a video that goes into a lot of data for Ohio, what to do, how to recognize it, give some statistics, what it looks like. So it's actually a really good um, in-service if you would like some more information about human trafficking.